Health is one of the most important, if not the most important topic for any population or individual. In 2019, our legislators passed the Universal Healthcare Act or Republic Act 11223. The landmark law expands access to health services by automatically enrolling all Filipinos in PhilHealth's National Health Insurance Program. It seeks to ensure that all Filipino citizens have access to a comprehensive set of health services without financial hardship. According to our Socioeconomic Planning Secretary, Ernesto Perna, our medium-term plan recognizes human development not just as a means of economic development, but as an end in itself. That is why the signing of the UHC law is a victory scored for the health sector. We are glad that we have reached this milestone. And President Duterte, on signing the law, said, by automatically enrolling our citizens into the National Health Insurance Program and expanding PhilHealth coverage to include free medical consultations and laboratory tests, the UHC law will guarantee equitable access to quality and affordable health care services to all Filipinos. After almost a year, the implementing rules and regulations were finally written and signed by the Secretary of Health, Dr. Francisco T. Duque. In this episode of Health Issues, we will explain what universal health care law really means. This is Dr. Teddy Herbosa, and we will be talking to Dr. Emerito Faraon about the salient features of the UHC law and the issues and concerns regarding the progressive attainment of universal health care for all Filipinos. Our guest today is Dr. Emerito Jose Faraon, MD, MBA, is an assistant professor of the College of Public Health former assistant to the Dean for Academic Affairs and former chair of the Department of Health Policy and Administration in the College of Public Health of the University of the Philippines, Manila. He teaches courses in hospital administration, public health administration, health economics, and research methods in health informatics. Emmer, welcome back to Health Issues. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Dr. Ted Herbosa. It is an honor again to be here. Um, I guess we have a very exciting afternoon. Yes, let's start with the basic question. What is universal health coverage or universal health care, as we call it in the Philippines? In the Philippines, um, actually, there is still a debate on the care part and the coverage part. Yes. It's actually universal health care for us. But I think there was a long debate on the care and the coverage because the World Health Organization sees it as coverage. So the, for the Philippines, it's universal, meaning all Filipinos are covered. Uh, they will not suffer from financial catastrophe. And these services are all accessible, uh, affordable, and of quality. Very good definition. How, what, so what is the universal health care law uh, in the Philippines? The universal health care law uh, ensures, and, uh, ensures that everyone uh, from the barangay to the national level will be following a certain framework on how it is going to be delivered. So it was passed, uh, it was discussed a long time. For a long time, it was just an advocacy. And uh, now, uh, after years, I, I think even before, it was just a journal article. So propagated by the Universal Healthcare Study Group. And it, I think, spanned at least two uh, administrations, two presidents, right. before it was finally signed into law by this administration. Uh, and I think um, it, was, it is, as described by the website of the Department of Health, a progressively uh, um, uh, policy. Yeah, that progressive the, attainment of universal health So it's, it's, it's not an end point yet. Yes so, yes. so it's a progressive work in progress. It's work in progress. Yes. In um, so when you say universal health care or universal health coverage, who are we trying to cover? All Filipinos. So basically all Filipinos. So if I'm a foreigner, I'm not covered? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, it, it is the resources, our resources for Filipinos. Because before you still have to show your card, you have to be a member. But now I think it, just as long as you are a Filipino, a, citizen. a Filipino citizen, and that is what the universal there means as far as the country is concerned. So the, our constitution actually provides that uh, health care is a right yes. 
And that right is supposed to be provided by government, but this kind of right is a progressive right. It's not like right to life, talagang you're alive. Yes. You're actually alive. But the right to uh, healthcare or access to equitable, affordable healthcare is a progressive one, correct? Because it's an imperfect way of delivering it. There's a, it's dependent on how the government will give it to you. And government is, is uh, of two types, yes. local and national. Correct. And that uh, there is a complexity in the local because we have a different way of interpreting the law. Much like the Bible, everyone interprets it differently. So let, let's talk about that. I mean, it seems that universal health care law is actually about tweaking or reforming the health system. Yes. Can you describe the health system prior to the law and where we plan to bring this health system in the future with the presence of the law? I think before, well, depends when you, where you start. Before it was uh, actually, before the Pimentel law, which was the devolution law, was uh, centralized. So all services stem from our lead health system, which is the Department of Health. Like DepEd. DepEd is centralized. So yes. all schools are under DepEd yes. and are run by and employed by teachers yes. from DepEd. But what happened during the Pimentel Law? Pimentel Law, you're referring to the local government code. Local government the code, 1992. 1992 19 code. Yes. What happened there? So now it's just like the parent having children the children can uh, already fend for themselves, so you part. So these are the mayors, these are the local government units. So they decided to give parts of the health system to the local government, yes. correct? Decision making, Decision -making resource allotment, employment. Yes, all of those things. So as, after that, what happened? Department of Health took care of like uh, 70 hospitals, right? Yes. And uh, regional centers. Yes, sir. And then the local government, the governors took care of of the local uh, primary local health hospitals, system. the provincial hospitals, yes. and then the mayors took care of the uh, health centers, the health centers. centers and the health districts. So very interesting. So we fragmented our health system in a way, or we decentralized. There, some people say fragmented. Some people say it's centralized, decentralized, and closer to the people. It depends on the perspective. So. I think it has its advantages. It also has its disadvantages. If you're very efficient with your managerial administrative uh, prowess in the local uh, setting, then it will work. So you, we have to define a term that comes out often in universal health coverage. It's called equity. Mm. Another, another, there was, another big there, word. This, law, this local government code created inequity for the poor. Yes, because... Um, um, these resources, uh, not all municipalities, not all uh, local government units are rich or Correct. first first class. Uh, you know, municipalities first class, second class, up to fifth, sixth class. Fifth, sixth class. The the fifth, the sixth class are the poorest. First class is uh, more wealthy. So the income uh, resources are not the same. And with income, because that's the primary thing, uh, comes human resources, equipment even the scales needed. Uh, and there's always the tendency, of course, to go to the more populous areas. So when I, when, uh, I say you go for universal health care or universal health coverage, yes, I agree with you in principle. Yes, I do want that if I'm the mayor. But uh, my capacity, my skills, my resources, I, 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 can't, I, I don't think I can do it the way you envisioned it. So I think there is that uh, uh, sort debate. Of, uh, divide, divide and, and, and debate. debate. So equity, while uh, equity will 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 be there in equity, the, the drive for equity is there as uh, the principle of the law. But inequity will exist because much as I, if I was the mayor, would like to uh, deliver the services uh, as you envisioned it, I cannot because uh, I'm I'm limited by what I have. So, but that also came in the time where in the government didn't have enough funds for health. The health budget wasn't high. So the private sector continued to develop. You can get access to health care, but you will have to pay a private hospital for all the modern care, medicines, yes. anti-cancer. But the poor were left with minimal. Uh, the government. The yes, government yes. funding was minimal and the meager budget had to be divided to 
and there's a larger population. And there's also the question of quality. And because of that, the quality will also yes. suffer. So they say that there's this study. Um, I haven't found it yet, but the, it, it sounds logical. So uh, word association between government hospitals and a private hospital. They say that the people go to the private hospitals for quality, but it is expensive. Then they go to the government hospitals, uh, not so expensive, but, affordable. It, but it's affordable or probably free or comes with a discount. So, so can you define that? So what is affordable healthcare? So we've defined inequity as the divide between the economics of the health services delivered. So what is affordable? Affordable is something that will not drive you into financial catastrophe. Affordable is something that after getting sick, I will not be very poor afterwards. I will not I will still be able to pay the tuition fee of my children. I'll be able to pay the rent of my whatever. I, uh, Maybe we can describe the, to the viewers like some of the health systems in other countries, like the Scandinavian countries or even the UK, where there is a national health service. As long as you're a citizen, you will you, get health care. You are covered. You are covered. From the, from the time you're born to the time you're uh, in the tomb, you are covered by the government. And if you need... Uh, open heart surgery, the government will take care yes. of it. Yes. Uh, so I think in, in those countries, they're very, uh, I mean, they were ahead of us in, in uh, interpreting it. And they are not, the, as, as you said, fragmented as we are. So they might be also subdivided, but there is that centralized notion of if they uh, give uh, money, uh, you said single payer or uh, a pool, uh, of money, uh, uh, a good percentage of that really goes to health, such that if it's curative, preventive, everything, all those sets of services will be delivered to the person's concern. So this passage of the universal health care law is like a stamp pad of approval that the government does value health and life of its uh, human, yes. of its people, of its population. The fact that now they are uh, creating a framework of a health system that is affordable and equitable to the Filipinos. Yes, but it's, it's, it's a progressive... Um, okay, so let's talk about progressive. What services can be delivered as of now? Right? Like, like now when I ask people about PhilHealth, PhilHealth will cover only like 30% of your expenses when you're hospitalized. And it doesn't cover your outpatient diagnostic and your outpatient care. What changes with the law? Uh, we, what, what changed with the law is that I think the primary focus now, I mean, it's like uh, educating the people at the same time. Uh, deviate from the curative. Yes. Deviate from the uh, massive treatment, which, as you know, entails more cost for the government and for the people. That's why out-of-pocket is also increasing. So more on the primary health care services, preventive and, uh, side. So, yeah, pre so uh, this is part of the, uh, as you know, there's uh, NCDs. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the triple burden already of the disease. So that's NCDs, uh, non-communicable diseases, infectious diseases, and of course the diseases of... Uh, and it, uh, it, it will, hope, I hope it will also concentrate not only on primary health care, but also on health promotion and prevention. Yes. So maybe we can define that to the people. So what is primary care? What is health promotion? What is pr primary prevention? Okay, well, um, we start first with primary health care. I think that's the basis. I think this was there long before. 70s, Alma Ata. Health for all. Uh, yeah, health it for was all, by the year 2000. 1974. <laughs> yes. And so 2000 came, and there was no health it for all. There was health inequity in the whole world. And if you get a thesaurus, probably you would see that health for all is actually universal. Universal, correct. So that's, that's still universal health care. So it's, I think, it's just a, a rolling, uh, progressive thing. But that primary health care never happened. But for so many reasons, of course, uh, it, it could be said that it creates jobs because if it's business-driven, you earn more money. So it gives uh, these corporations uh, more money, more jobs. You create more jobs. But uh, the notion of universal health care is preventive so that you do not uh, end up with a terminal illness and you get to catch the symptoms first. So that's the primary, that's why it's primary. So secondary and tertiary, um, you probably end up in a hospital getting confined. Uh, of course, there are those cases as well. 
but uh, nipping it in the bud, I think it's the... So, so let, let me... Key. When the PhilHealth law was created, or the National Health Insurance Act of 1994, when it was created, the PhilHealth was designed so that it would take care of the people's hospitalization needs. And that continued on, but its uh, support value or money was only a small proportion. So the people still had to pay a lot for hospitalization. What changes now? Because I think in the UHC law, they're saying that PhilHealth will pay for uh, consultation in the primary health care clinic and laboratory tests in the, in the health care clinic. What changes now and how will this be implemented? Um, as I said, as long as you are Filipino, you, you are covered. So uh, patients, uh, when they come and they consult, they have different illnesses. So it could be terminal, it could be chronic, so it could be a, a primary ailment. So uh, uh, feel health as the financial arm of the universal healthcare would be able to deliver both kinds of services. So the whole spectrum, be it primary, be it secondary, and be it tertiary. So the, but the emphasis, again, it's in IT, Italicized words is primary. So I'm also weaning away the patients from thinking chronic because uh, part of it is also a education and health promotion, but in a subtle way, delivering it through the financing part. So I will not. Uh, so they've now decided to focus on primary prevention yes. and even secondary prevention. Yes. If you have non communicable disease, they prevent you. If you have hypertension, make sure they control your hypertension so that you don't get a stroke or a heart attack, and correct? Another key to that is the, uh, the referral system. So, so it's like uh, hospitals, uh, level three hospitals, those are tertiary hospitals, are for those with chronic illnesses. Correct. So your barangay health station, your rural health unit, or probably anything that is in the municipal area would be towards preventive and primary. Can you describe so, to me so, how that will happen? So because I, I, I'm thinking about a headache or a stomach yeah. ache. So you come to the hospital. The first notion of a Filipino is go to my doctor. And yes. where, where is your doctor? And of the course, hospital. In the hospital. So that will be uh, kind of remedied or tweaked. It, it will, uh, uh, you will be referred back to where you are. So it's something like that, that uh, you will be in that service delivery network. That's how they term it, uh, where you belong. and. Uh, if you have gone there already, you have this certification that uh, you have been seen. And of course, if the diagnostics show that you really indeed need tertiary care, then that is the time that you will go there. So I, I think that that referral system, that financing part, uh, is really uh, tailored to go into preventive. And you go, if you're uh, yeah, chronic or terminal, you go to the right um, mechanic shop if you're a car. How does that work? Uh, uh, I, have, I have, let's say, uh, diabetes. I cannot go to my endocrinologist. I have to go to a primary health care center. Yes, you have to go to the primary I, network. I am first. referred to the endocrinologist. And the usual notion, of course, is where you live. So what is near to you? So where's your place of residence? So everyone will have a service delivery network. So that's very different from the way people access healthcare today. Because the way people access healthcare today is, Dr. Herbosa, do you know anyone who is a good endocrinologist? Yeah. And then I refer them to the endocrinologist and they go straight to them. So you mean that cannot happen anymore? Or it, it can still happen. If you can pay. Yes, but... Uh, Phil Health will not pay my is, visit to the endocrinologist. No, no. There is this slow education through that kind of setup that you will, that doctor probably or that expense, whatever consultation that was, will not uh, get the correct reimbursement or will not be reimbursed totally unless because they jump the, the queue. The, uh, the referral system. Okay, now I'll ask you. We have a lack of doctors. Most of our doctors are specialists because I was in med school. Everybody wanted to become a specialist. I'm a surgeon. So it took me years of training to become a surgeon. But who will take care? Who, where will we get the primary physicians? Or we call that family and community medicine, right? 
So where are we going to get all these family physicians that will take care of 100 million Filipinos? It, it does not exist right now Correct. At, at this point. So as I said before, it is a work in progress. Yes. So the Department of Health, I think, is making, um, uh, talking to uh, primary care physicians, building that network, primary health care, uh, strengthening that. Uh, so uh, our schools produce the doctors. I think there has been changes in the curriculum now to orient our medical, not like the ones we did before, where uh, you enter school and of course after medical school, enter into a residency program where you are expected to become a specialist. Specialist, correct. Now, so our country, our Filipinos, are, have a certain discrimination toward the generalist and primary care. They prefer to see the specialist immediately <laughs> because the thinking is, the specialist is good because they had more years of training. And that is a mindset that needs to be changed. It needs to be changed. Yeah, because my friends from the UK, they cannot access a specialist without going to their assigned GP. They call it in the UK, GP. A GP actually is a general, general practitioner. practitioner, but they can diagnose. And without his referral, without his gatekeeping, you cannot access an orthopedic surgeon, an endocrinologist, a surgeon like me. And we don't have that yet, now. Yes, yeah, so how do we build that? <laughs> That's the big question. <laughs> so it's a work in progress, as I've told you. The Department of Health right now is trying to beef up its primary health care approach, uh, starting with, uh, of course, the universities, the universities who produce the health professionals and orient them uh, into more family, community approaches, primary health care. How? Of course, by changing the curriculum. Um, of course, uh, in the University of the Philippines, we have talks uh, already of changing the curriculum, and you know that. And in the College of Medicine where I teach, yes. the, the goal is community-oriented medical education. Yes. So this is not the curriculum where we uh, were oriented to before. So, but it, as I said, it will not happen overnight. Correct. And so the education would begin with the educators, who are the doctors facing the patients. Oh, so the university and the other medical schools have a big role to play yes. in shifting the focus of the young doctors, the medical students, to understand universal health care systems and uh, primary care systems. Because right? you, they are the first ones to have contact with the patients. So. I think they also play a role in being educators to the patient on how to shift that mindset that if I have a stomach ache or a headache, I should go to my uh, specialist doctor in the hospital. But, but you know, I'll tell you that, that was very hard because as a medical student, when the person that came in to lecture in our class was a surgeon, he was driving a Mercedes Benz. He was wearing a nice signature tie and signature belt and shoes. So I said, I want to be like him. You know, he has lots of money. <laughs> then the person from family and community medicine would enter. enter. And he was wore wearing jeans and t-shirt. His hair was scruffy. So he didn't epitomize a model that I wanted to be as a doctor. How can we uh, shift that uh, <laughs> role modeling for our young people? I guess we have to go back to the basics. Our model doctor is actually Jose Rizal. Jose Rizal, I think didn't care for Mercedes-Benz, didn't care for... But he trained in Germany. But he trained <laughs> because there was no, nothing at that point uh, during that time. So uh, I think the model would be service. Service, service to, yes. Yes, you can still get into residency. Yes, you can still be a specialist. But serve and, and observe the countryside first. Serve this community where primary health care is supposed to be delivered. So yes. Actually, I'll second your motion, huh? because I became a surgeon and I started operating in remote villages. And the gratification is actually great. In fact, I'm flying off to Mindanao again uh, in a couple of days to do free surgical mission to offer it to the people who have no access to specialists. So I think there's a gratification as well to being what you're describing and it is just not communicated to the medical students. That offering of service to the poor and to the people. Because the mindset is just like uh, an internship. Yeah. You get to rotate all, to all disciplines. Now you get to rotate to the countryside yes. first and then choose your residency if you still would like to go into family medicine or a specialist like a cardiologist. So, but that is, I'm, I'm stating it very fast. 
but actually it's a yearly, it's a slow progress. So from the university to the doctors, out there practice, out there practice to the patient, patient now knows the referral system. I think it will come in phases before you will really know the notion that uh, it's universal. In fact, care. when we passed the law and there was more money in the health system, our government hospitals became more overcrowded. Yes. Because every Filipino, with or without PhilHealth, can now go to the hospital and access health services because before, they will not go. I would see patients in the ER and I would ask them, why didn't you go, come to the ER last week when you were feeling bad? I didn't have money. But now money is no longer an issue because there is uh, provided for that they cannot be denied health care. And strengthening the local health system yeah. before you go to the hospital. Okay, so now you've described the word. The word is health system. We've talked about manpower and professionalizing, creating more GPs and family physicians and community doctors. So that's going to be a struggle. The university has a role in that. So let's talk about the health system. What will be the role of the Department of Health, the role of the local government hospitals, the low role of medical centers or what I call uh, apex hospitals? How will the whole architecture look like? Because it's a fragmented system, they will now create uh, uh, near-perfect uh, networks to deliver this. Because it's so many fragments. I word mong near perfect. I cannot say it's perfect. So it's, it's near perfect. So it's, a, it's still a work in progress as we go on. So under the universal healthcare law, there will be service delivery being made effective in the local health system. The local health system, as they defined it in the implementation sites, would be composed of, of course, the barangay health stations, the municipal health office, uh, the provincial health office with a tie up with either the district hospital, the provincial health hospital, acting as the part answering for the therapeutic uh, treatment part, while the local, uh, where you will begin your navigation, should be the primary health care. So you cannot go directly to the hospital without being cleared first by your either your municipal health officer, your rural health physician, your public health associates there. It's a team that is really focused on primary health care before going there. So you could have a terminal illness, uh, but still you would probably be seen first in that primary health care uh, setting before being... Uh, uh, Emmer, I see that yes. as uh, implementable and doable mm in the public health system, in the government. Mm. But our healthcare system is also composed of the private sector. Yes. And the private sector attracts paying people that will jump the gun. We, they pride themselves of specialists, expensive tests that you, you know, they, they, have, they advertise their new CT scan, their new PET scan, the latest ultrasound. So how do we that is the uh, mindset, change this divide? That is the mindset that we're trying to break and uh, educate the people. We, so um, you said that in the Constitution, health is a human right. Uh, and the universal health care law tries to guarantee that. But with that comes also the education that they should be involved in the decision making of their own health. So it should begin again in the uh, primary setting. So how do you, how do you say that... Uh, the marketing of the first class CT scan, it doesn't necessarily translate into getting well. So, so uh, I think it, it should be the doctor underneath. It's advertising, it's marketing. It's basically saying yes. we have the best and most modern machine. So in, in, it doesn't translate to better healthcare for in, Filipinos. In, in trying to win that perspective, the Department of Health, I think, will try or is already trying to shake hands with the private sector. So they're trying now to involve even those uh, physicians with private practices. So you're probably a rich physician coming from a rich family. So you have this uh, family-owned clinic. Uh, you will also be accorded that uh, uh, offer to join that network because that is the network that is composed both of the public and the private. So the network will be a geographic network and people will, will be both the public hospitals and the private sector hospitals should be inclusive. Yes, and they, know, and they know the navigation system, and they know the network. So if you're the one with the 
all the superb uh, technology, you will say, hey, did you go with the rural uh, health unit first or the barangay health station? Because you probably do not need this. Uh, tests. So that is the ideal notion of how the, na the navigation and uh, the network should work. So that's a local health system. A local health with system. With Apex Hospital, with different spokes, so uh, hub and spokes model. Yes. So you have at the periphery primary health care, yes. and then they refer to an Apex or the either the, the private or the medical center, public medical center, to provide tertiary care. But you have to help them also uh, uh, learn that tertiary is different from primary so that at the, not because there is this CT scan that will, a CT scan will not heal the headache so yes but it will entail more expense and not, it does not necessarily translate that if you shell out big money um, you get cured correct correct so uh, we're trying to to improve on that uh, mindset and uh, tell these people that... Uh, That's health literacy. Health literacy. That's another and, uh, topic we need to discuss. Not an overnight thing Correct. That, Correct. that will happen. Because we have to make our people literate about what is vital in healthcare and what is just an icing on the cake. Yes, but I see the, probably 20 years from now, it is really a very, very good system functioning. And this universal healthcare law, which we started now, uh, has a as a uh, happy ending. I have a few minutes left, and I'd like to ask you about uh, issues and concerns about this nice picture that you're painting. Going to this at attainment of universal health care, I think we will have many bumps, because the way you describe it is we have human capital development to do, we have health systems improvement to do, we have education and we need primary care and we need health promotion. Uh, and, and, it's a lot of work. And as a, an asymmetry, what I call an asymmetry of information of what it really is, what That's universal health care law. So, what is asymmetry of information? Uh, not, not, uh, there is an imbalance of what the patient knows and what the doctor knows. So there is also an imbalance of what the Department of Health tries to say and what the patient knows. It is always the patient, because that is our client, who should know what it is really. So, and the second part is the governance part, the, the ones in the so local... So first, group. we need to put the patient in the center of the system. Yes. So he is, he is the one being served by the system. Yes. We must be able to address his needs and must be able to make him satisfied. Yes. yes. And then the second one is? The, the, the leadership and governance part of the health system. So these are the local government heads. So they are very, very vital partners. They are not doctors. Well, some probably are doctors, and that makes it easier for them to implement UHC. So I call that leadership and governance. Leadership and so governance. The next part is really ma making sure that these systems, they don't work by themselves. Yes. They must be led, and they must have a governance system that is not corrupt, that is, not, uh, that is efficient. That is efficient. That's very ideal. Correct. Oh, yes. And another, I think, uh, missed point is health information. So mm -hmm. health information, I, I, I did not see it in the highlights. In, in the, the IRR. Yeah, uh, even in the law, I, I did not see it uh, being highlighted like service delivery, leadership. Are you talking government. about health information, digital health, or are you talking about? A centralized system, even. Knowledge management. Knowledge so management, knowledge management is management probably the better term, yes. Okay. So uh, a knowledge management in that local health system, such that the mayor, who probably is not health-oriented, is not a doctor, would probably be able to allocate his resources or her resources more efficiently towards the end goal. I know what you're talking about because I've seen this with my classmates who studied in Canada. Because Canada has these Ottawa rules on, on knee play, head injury rules. So who goes to the next echelon of care is decided by evidence-based guidelines that yes. helps the primary care physician. And we need to develop those because we cannot get the Canadian and apply it in the Philippine health system. But if you don't have an information infrastructure, uh, it will, you know, when you, when you decide, when you make a decision, especially this uh, authority, you need good information. You cannot decide just on a whim. So you cannot decide just because that person voted for me. It's not a good decision. So you need updated 
uh, reliable information. And that is electronic probably, so that it would be better. So that is the part that will also help health promotion, health education, navigating the system, mm -hmm. making it work from primary health care to the tertiary level of care. Very interesting. Any final words to our uh, viewers here out there about universal health care? We will hold your hand, uh, but uh, bear with us. Uh, I am from the uh, academe, so bear with us in the education part. Uh, this will be made perfect soon. Well, with that, I'd like to thank you all for covering uh, health issues and concerns regarding the universal health care law. It seems this is work in progress. We continue to strive for and achieve universal health care for all Filipinos, and we do hope that this law will succeed and will benefit each and every uh, Filipino out there. Maraming salamat, goodbye, and thank you very much.